Hello, everyone. This is Murat. I am a Stanford scientist, a co-founder of Mind Academy, and I'm also co-organizer of the meetup groups. Today, uh, we are broadcasting from Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley. And uh, this is the first time we are broadcasting all around the US. And uh, we should have a lot of participants from Chicago and New York today. So today, uh, so before I go introduce the, our uh, speaker, I'll talk about briefly what we are trying to do. And that difficult, uh, that we are going through a very difficult time. And we try to help the community uh, by taking our programs online. And we like to broadcast all around the world. And we organize several online meetups and uh, speeches. And we are also organizing free courses. We announced today uh, our first, uh, second free online course, the introduction to Python is given by a uh, Stanford scientist. And hopefully it will be a good start for everyone to get in the uh, data science career. So we are also launching another uh, machine learning uh, online course. It will be starting also in the second week of April. And you can get the announcements through our meetup groups or from our email list. So uh, we have uh, five announced meetup for this uh, upcoming month. So hopefully you can join. We're gonna announce more meetups. We try to make it uh, reach programs uh, while you guys staying at home. So uh, today I will talk about our, uh, I will introduce you our speaker, Divya. Uh, she is a lead data scientist, Levi Strauss. And she focuses on improving customer experience by working on challenging and diverse ML problems, such as building recommender systems and personalizing user journey and inventory forecasting for wholesale and optimizing margins. And when she's not crunching numbers, she loves to plan and travel. So we'd like to thank her uh, to lead the today's uh, meetup and to talk about real-time and personalized recommendation systems. Hope you enjoyed the, today's uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I hope everyone can hear me now. So my name is Divya, and I'm the lead data scientist at Levi Strauss and Company. So we are mostly involved in building machine learning solutions for all three channels of selling, um, including uh, e-commerce, retail, and our wholesale partners. So Levi sells, of course, we sell jeans and um, tops and other kinds of accessories, and we sell them through all three channels. And when I say whole wholesale, we sell them to Macy's, Kohl's, and so on. And when it's retail, it's our owned and operated stores. And when it's e-commerce, it's our website. So today's uh, content is more around um, uh, what we have done on our website. But the way we have built this is more like a data product uh, so that uh, it can be used across some of the retail and wholesale applications as well, which I get, will get into at in the end of the uh, presentation. Um, but before I go on, uh, I just want to address that it's a very, very difficult situation that we are in as a nation and also as a company. And I hope everyone is staying safe and taking care and practicing as much as social distancing as possible. And um, from Levi's perspective, we have undertaken a lot of uh, initiatives in order to get us through this difficult time, uh, such as forecasting, especially from data science perspective, such as forecasting how uh, the trend has been in China as China is making their recovery and help understand when US will make their recovery because that would ensure the jobs of so many people who have worked in our retail stores and are currently not being uh, working even though we pay them the full wages throughout this lockdown. We still want to ensure that we give them a timeline of when they would be back to their normal lives. And that's 
kind of some of the efforts that we've been leading so far um, in the last two, three weeks where we've stopped all our other projects so that we can give priority to those, just to give an outline of how we are dealing with it as a company. And um, now I can start my presentation. So I'm going to talk about personalized recommendations. So I've divided the topic into three major buckets. The first bucket is going to be about what exactly is the business need. So whenever we build um, these kind of applications and want to scale them across and also want them to be a data product where it's accessible by an API, we really need to understand what is the business need because as data scientists, that's something that we kind of lack. Whereas people like merchandising, planning, especially in a retail organization, they have such rich understanding of what the business needs. And if we listen to them, we would be able to make a much better product. So I want to talk through that. And then we also, I uh, definitely would get into the data science part of it as a second part of the presentation. And then the third part of the presentation is more about the scaling. So when we build these kind of recommender system, it uses both bad jobs, uh, which run in a scheduled time, and also some of um, the real time applications such as what is the user browsing right now? What is the user adding to cart right now to power recommendations? So when we combine these two very disparate um, sources at different time points, it really needs to be a system which can scale and can also handle the hits uh, when it's a peak period, such as our holidays or the Thanksgiving and so on. So I'll talk into many versions that we went through in order to get to a truly scalable system, uh, which we kind of use as template for our many other projects that we are working on. So without further ado, I can get into this. So before I get into it, I want to show about how recommendations is really making an impact in many facets of our life, some of which is known and some of which is not known. Like for example, is uh, one of the famous example is movies, of course, Netflix. Netflix is a pioneer in movie recommendations as we all know. And their entire homepage is completely personalized with different kinds of recommendations. And Netflix's data says that over 80% of what people watch comes from their recommendations. And of course, recommendations are driven mainly by machine learning. Music, so Spotify heavily uses machine learning in order to personalize all of their uh, different views like Discover Weekly and um, all the mixes that they make for us and so on. And everything is definitely powered by machine learning. I bet. Then, of course, there's shopping. Uh, so shopping is heavily powered by uh, machine learning. Um, and one of the famous examples is, of course, Amazon. And Amazon is definitely a pioneer in terms of introducing the recommendation systems for shopping, but also in terms of uh, introducing many of the algorithms that we right now use in recommendations as well, such as item to item collaborative filtering came out of some of the research that um, Amazon had put together. So that provides a good segue of uh, Levi's because we use it primarily for shopping as well. So before, um, as I mentioned, we start with what exactly Exactly was a business need and why do we need to build such a big scalable system in-house? So recommendations actually exist offline. Uh, there are a lot of recommendations and that examples that I showed through, but um, every day we do experience them in Slack. So one of the examples is given here. This is from one of the reviews on the health and he was knowledgeable about the different styles since he carries so many styles of jeans and help them find exactly what they're looking for, even though they were so much better and they found some amazing pieces. So uh, I have highlighted certain points which gives you an idea of um, what we really need to build a recommender system for that can replace this kind of an offline personal experience when they go online as well. So it has to be super friendly and it has to be intuitive. So when the user sees that they should understand why and they, it should be completely knowledgeable and user is going through but be two phases. And uh, it helps find what they're looking for, but also helps them find what they weren't expecting to find exactly. So samples are some complex items such as an hat, hat to accessorize the outfit and so on and so forth. And um, that gave us an idea of what exactly is the quality of a good recommendation. So this is what we are all our It makes the customer journey intuitive and frictionless. It best reflects and communicates the values. And this is super important these um, use to our website and they see a recommendation. 
is not only about what is recommended to them, it also communicates something about what the brand is trying to convey. So uh, this is something that our business play a uh, recommenders on our homepage. We really wanted to align to our brand values. And it also focuses on what consumers exactly want and not who they are. So this is a very key point. Um, it also encompasses what uh, Google and Facebook went through when they started the advertising platform as your ads. And when they started out uh, placing personalized ads, it was completely personalized on demographics. And as it went forward, they realized demographics itself is not giving a key idea of what the user wants, but using demographics plus browsing patterns really gives what the consumer wants. Because consumers, when they shop, uh, they're not only shopping for themselves, they shop for other people, they sh they, their shopping needs change. So if you're just segmenting based on who they are and demographics, you lose a lot of other markers, which comes to the next point, which is using both implicit behavioral markers and explicit e input. So um, since we are not Amazon and we don't want all our consumers to sign in before they make their purchase, uh, Levi's as a company really relies a lot on the implicit behavioral markers rather than explicit uh, input. To give more clarity on that, implicit is actions such as clicks, views, add to carts, and might be just based on cookies. We do not know their name. We do not know their personal information. And that's most part of our data. Whereas explicit input is because Amazon makes everyone sign in before they make a purchase. So you, you exactly know who they are before they even purchase and um, all the demographics associated with it. Um, people rate products a lot on Amazon. And so they have a lot of explicit inputs, whereas we rely a lot on implicit inputs. And um, the last point is it provides relevant information in a timely manner and to expedite decision making. Uh, to expand on this part, uh, it provides relevant information, which is basically the recommenders recommendations, but in a timely manner, that means depending on where they are in the consumer journey, it has to differ. So we, we, I'll show you some examples of how we went about the thought process of how they are in their consumer journey. And it also ex uh, helps to expedite decision making. So the user comes to the website to shop with an idea of whether they're going to buy or not. And a good recommended system can really push them into buying that product that they're looking for. So before we go further, what are the different consumer touch points? When we talk about consumer touch points, we actually touch consumers through so many different touch points, both offline, online, and in stores, and so on. So some of them are um, mapped out here. So how we have divided the consumer touch points is the first touch point is, of course, awareness. So um, some of the examples are just getting aware of the brand. So mainly through PR, online ads, emails, and so on, and even searches. And when they move into consideration phase, now they have understood about the brand and they want, they are really considering buying something from us. So they go to our landing page and then they go to the direct mall or third party site and so on. And then finally, when they're willing to make a purchase, in some cases, yes, they purchase online, but some, some of our consumers, we do observe that, especially since we sell jeans, they would like to go to a store, try it on, and then uh, make a purchase. So they go to the store and make a purchase. So it's basically the same consumer traveling all through, and we want to be able to track them. And then when they make a purchase, again, they have many touch points, which is either through the website, through the store, or they make a call to the call center, and so on. And then after that, it, they move to the service bucket where they have the call center and so on. And then finally, they move to the loyalty bucket, which is... After they make a purchase, we call them our loyal consumers, and they we still communicate with them through promotions on invoice, blog, emails, and so on. And why I'm showing this whole picture is we do apply recommendations to each and every touch point here. And I'll talk about it in detail as we go along. But recommendations has the power to influence every single touch points, be it call center, be it emails, be it um, ads. Um, we are able to touch every consumer through personalized recommendations. And throughout this presentation, uh, I would be talking mainly about the landing page, which is our home page, uh, which is our uh, first ever product that we launched. Um, but I'll also give you an idea of how we did it on other pages and other uh, channels as well. So before we go uh, on, uh, I just want to give a brief of what existed before we started doing it in-house. So we did have a vendor who was providing us with most retail companies. Um, we have vendors who provided recommendations. So we had Adobe's out of the box, stagnant bestsellers, and it's basically consistent for all users. And it was the same experience across all pages as well. So you can see this was what existed. So 
basically it had a generic title which says recommended for you even though it's not recommended to that particular person and it's a completely non personalized recommendations so the first thing was the copy was kind of misleading as to what we are exactly recommending to the user then we see a lot of mixed gender products so we don't know uh, if the user is male or female so you're showing a mix of both which is kind of okay because sometimes we really don't know who they are but sometimes we do know who they are and if we keep showing mixed gender products it's not really going to uh, click with them and then there's a mix of sale and non sale products this is the brand value that i was talking about we really don't want to show a sale item as soon as a user lands on the home page unless it's personalized and we know that this person has affinity for a sale item we really do not want to show them that and also uh, the product refresh for adobe happens only once in 24 hours so they're not getting updated feeds every minute like how we can get and so sometimes it costs wrong prices to be displayed and hence when the user clicks on it and they go to a product detail page they see a completely wrong uh, price and they would bounce off immediately so multiple problems that way and um, we have research uh, from bazaar voice which says that 38% of the consumers say they won't return to an online retailer that recommends things that doesn't make sense for them so clearly um, recommendations play a huge important part in the consumer journey So our goal was pretty simple to help our consumers in their product discovery journey by recommending relevant products. And uh, the motivation to go in-house, I have uh, mentioned a few of them already, is basically uh, the data. Uh, we have a ton of data. We have ton of real-time data, and we are not making use of any of that to personalize our experience. Seems um, like a real clear winner that we could have that we are not having. and the other thing is cost reduction so definitely we do not have to pay a vendor for this kind of an experience when we can build it in house and um, of course a lot of collaboration so as data scientists we are kind of in an isolated land where no one knows uh, exactly what we do and um, it becomes especially in retail organization which is 165 years old uh, the need for collaboration is a lot so we really need to learn the business as much as everyone in the business need to understand what we do So this is a very key project so that we can collaborate with different teams. So we have collaborated with more than 15 different teams to get this one live, including merchandising, planning, site testing, personalization, product, uh, engineering, um, QA, etc., etc., etc. So that really helped. This project really helped us to do that collaboration and uh, help them realize what else can we do with data science. And then the fourth one is completely customized. So if uh, there's a sale uh, or if there's some products that we really want to boost to our consumers, say we want to move our five one consumer to a five eleven because that's kind of how we are trending, this really helps us to give that customized recommendations. Then um, building a found fundamental capability, as I mentioned, this is a data product. This is not a one off um, analysis that we are doing, but we want to build a fundamental capability that say can be used in stores or customer service, and um, helps in continuous testing because we can keep on changing the code how we want we don't have to depend on a vendor to do that and modular deployment so everything is returned in a modular fashion so it's very easy to change things as we move along and we want to see different experiences so the first process was to scope so we these are the many teams that we worked with to scope it so business teams market research uh, who helped us understand um, by using consumer insights and many platforms to talk to actual consumers and get us insights on what they are expecting ab testing team to set up an ab test to understand whether our experience would perform better than what exists because we don't want to launch something just because we made it in house we really want it to work then analytics who helped us analyze all the data and then merchandising who helped us understand what kind of product the users are looking for and what kind of experience we want to ensure site personalization to help personalize the experience data engineering devops ui ux pretty uh, self explanatory on why they would be there in the panel um some examples of what came out scoping there were some interesting insights that we did not know and of course this really helped us so they wanted in session personalization that's a no brainer because the current experience is not based on what the user search it's really not personalized it doesn't update at all And no need to talk about this because we don't want to show some kind of hard marked products that we uh, to all our new visitors because they would just buy that and they would never buy our full price products, which is not a good experience for our brand. And then there's no special except some special sales which go on on our website where a user has to provide their email ID in order to access that sale. So we don't want that product to be shown here because then they know that 
um, this, they could just access, go to it directly without going, providing their ID, which we really need to map the user. And then uh, we don't, uh, we want to do a lot of inventory checks. So that was a major problem that we were showing products which are not in inventory or it's not in inventory for their particular size. So to the extent that we can infer a user's size, we would want to show products that are in uh, stock in their size or at least in stock for 80% uh, of the sizes that are being ordered. So we uh, wrote an algorithm for that as well. And uh, dynamic UI titles with continuous testing. So as I mentioned, the title really was not personalized. And um, we really felt that there is a lot of uh, money involved when we change the titles. So we wanted that whole experience to keep changing titles and um, really being personalized to the user. So now we can go to the most exciting part, which is uh, kind of around, okay, what, what exactly is the machine learning part of it uh, throughout this process? So, so before we get into machine learning, let's of course talk about data or to, as to what kind of data sources did we use? And, okay, just checking. And it's spotty. I've shut down most of the apps. Um, please uh, message me if you still can't hear me. So, um, with respect to all the data, we do have uh, location. So, whenever a user comes to our website and starts browsing the products, we do get their location uh, from the cookie ID that we can infer. So, we can we are definitely using that data. Then um, we are using device um, because we do get uh, the device associated with the cookie ID. We do get their channel, which is related to the marketing channel that they came from, such as paid ads, um, or um, did they come from email marketing channel and so on, because that really gives a key indication of whether they're going to convert or not. And we use that information. And the next thing is, of course, their actions, which is browsing, purchase, and all of their other actions that they do. And um, we also wanted to use their browsing actions uh, in, with respect to exactly what products they are browsing and um, so on and so forth. And um, The other information that uh, we wanted to use was related to their actual purchase. So if they had made a previous purchase or if they had made a purchase in the store and so on, we really wanted to use those data points as well in order to make a more informed decision. So some of the first types of models that we used are popularity-based recommendation models. So um, that is gen, uh, just based on what users are browsing. So everyone's uh, browsing information is taken into consideration. And as you can see from this um, small sketch, you can see that um, most of the consumers like the croissant and most of the consumers like the cupcake. So we would just recommend that. So we made it a little bit more complicated, of course, than uh, croissants and cupcakes uh, on our website by using uh, more than 10 different metrics. So some of the metrics uh, are like AUR, which is average unit retail, their um, costs associated with each of the products. Then we use things like um, uh, clicks, views, uh, revenue, and all of those metrics to uh, get a combined metric, which will rank what products we have to show. And then we show the 10 most popular products based on all these ranking. The ranking is based on what the consumer mostly need and also based on uh, what the business actually can move. So business is more interested in moving their average unit retail, more interested in converting the consumers. So using a combination of these two metrics really gets us those 10 products that we want to use. And we also segmented them by gender for people who we do not know anything about. So we wanted to show a mixed gender of products. So we showed both men and women's products and we showed certain categories. So we, um, for example, the brand did not want us to show any kind of underwear or accessories when the user first logs in and we know nothing about them. So we removed all of those and we just showed segments that they are uh, willing to show because Popularity base is what is going for nearly 40% of our consumers because we do not know really anything about them. This includes consumers who have cleared their cookies or consumers who have never visited our website, which is a lot of them. So we really wanted this experience to be consistent. So we did all of those metrics. And then, uh, and then of course, the most more popular one, which is collaborative filtering model, which basically um, there are many versions of collaborative filtering that I get into. So uh, it basically uses consumer data um, with respect to all the other consumers who have purchased on the website or added to cart on the website, or depending on which experience they are in, we use different collaborative filtering models and use all those information to find either similar consumers or similar items. 
and use that to recommend that to a third person. So I get into more details of the versions of it. So under collaborative filtering, we have two main buckets. The first bucket is memory based and the second bucket is model based. The memory based um, has similar products. Uh, so similar uses based on cosine similarity or Pearson correlation or Jacquard similarity. There are many scores that we use. And then take the weighted average of ratings. Um, ratings is an example in the slide, but what we exactly use is taking a weighted average of their preference to a certain product. And then uh, the major advantage to this is uh, it's easy and it's explainable, um, but the performance reduces when data is sparse and it's non-scalable. What they mean by that is when we call it memory base, we basically um, checking for every single user. So we create a user item matrix. So imagine we have more than 5 million users for whom we have data at any point in time. So we have to, if we have to create this user item matrix, um, we are able to do that because 5 million is not a lot. But uh, if we go beyond that, or if our consumers really explode, then we won't be able to do this kind of a memory-based approach where we find a score for every single user and find similar user for every single user. So the other approach is model-based approach, which we have used as well, which uses machine learning to find user ratings for unrated items. So basically uses it like a supervised problem where we are trying to predict what is the rating for that the user might give. And the advantage here is, of course, it's pretty much scalable because we, uh, we are training on a certain set of users and using that to test for other users and not um, use the same thing. And um, there's dimensionality reduction um, and it deals with uh, missing or sparse data much better than a memory-based approach. The disadvantage, uh, which is a problem for us, is the inference is intraceable because of hidden or latent factors. So what happens is if I'm saying that I'm recommending this product, the business comes to us and asks, well, I don't like my recommendation. It's a very, very common problem. Everyone in the building really goes and checks out and well, like, I don't like my recommendations. Why am I being sh shown shots? Why am I being uh, shown this? Whereas the memory-based approach helps us to explain to them why they are being shown certain things. The uh, machine learning approach does not help us to do that. So we have to take a call on which one we have to do. So how we started out was we did a lot of memory-based approach to start with to gain trust from our business stakeholders. And we can also explain to them what's happening. And then we slowly moved to model-based approach once they had an awareness of what we are doing. And we also had collected a lot of data to help train the model. Before that, we don't have any data of um, what is the true data in order to build a supervised model. Whereas once we launched with this, we have a lot of supervised data that we can use to do a model-based approach. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's other two types um, that we can think about in either model-based or memory-based, you could use user-based filtering or item-based filtering. So what this example says is this person really liked, uh, I should have put some genes examples, but I'm sorry. This person really liked grapes, strawberry, watermelon, and oranges. And uh, this person really likes strawberries. And there's this new person who comes and who likes strawberries and watermelon, and hence is more connected to the first person. And uh, we probably want to recommend them the two products that they do not browse or buy, which is their um, grapes and oranges, because we found them to be similar to this user. It's a very simplified notion to understand what exactly goes behind. But as I mentioned, we build this huge user item matrix and then convert everything into a vector and then find the cosine similarity between the users and then use that a cosine similarity to find what this new user might like. And item-based filtering is the opposite of that, um, where we look at it from the items viewpoint. So we see who has brought grapes, and um, who has bought um, strawberries and who has bought watermelons and um, oranges. And we see that um, people who buy uh, uh, grapes and watermelon, these two are being co-bought with, uh, with each other for these two people. So we kind of say that these two items are kind of similar. So then we go and look at who are the users that we can recommend these uh, kind of items to. So if this person has bought just one of those items, then we can recommend that other item to them. So that's the opposite of doing that. So other approaches include um, things like content-based filtering. So um, collaborative filtering also faces another major issue, which is what we call as cold start problem. And what is cold start problem is when we have a completely new user who we haven't trained our model for and is not able to identify, model-based approach work well, but memory-based approach does not work well because they're not in our user item matrix, right? And the other problem is when we introduce new products. 
So even if we go to item to item filtering, it only works well when it knows all the products that are there on our website, like all the genes and stuff. But we do a lot of collaborations. Like we had our Snoop Dogg uh, collaboration. We have we had Disney collaboration. We had so many collaborations that just launched in the nick of the time. So it just we will know two days in advance that it's going to launch. So we probably cannot train our model, or sometimes it might miss it. So we want to be aware of those situations and still recommend useful products to the users. So to combat cold start problem, we go to content-based filtering. In content-based filtering, again, we use three different sources that I'll talk in detail. The first one is purchase behavior. So of course, this is um, the one which will suffer from cold start problems. So you find what are the items that are co-bought with each other and just use that to recommend to a new user, which is the highest co-bought item, then just use that to recommend. It's not pretty intelligent and basically does not indicate a lot. So the other one is text embeddings. So if we know what the user is currently browsing, then we embed each and every product with its own vector and then find similar products based on that. So even new products will get into it. So if you're just using purchase behavior to find similar products, the new products are left out. So using text embeddings, you avoid that situation. And similarly, image embedding. So when a new product comes in, we do, we do run it through our model to get the image embedding immediately and then use that to find what are the similar products that the user might like. I'll also get into detail as we move into the next section on how we used it, how we used all these algorithms together to power one single carousel. So uh, before we go ahead, I want to show what is text embedding. So you can see this model is wearing this genes, but this genes has more than 50 different attributes. Some of the attributes are mentioned here, which shows the power of text attributes. So this is basically a veggie fit straight taper genes that we sell. The gender is women. It's a genes, it's 100% cotton, it's light wash, high rise, it's a regular genes, it's not plus size. And um, we know it's button fly uh, and it's not a zip fly. We know it's straight and veggie, we know it's waterless, um, which is um, our conservation, uh, um, part of our conservation efforts to make it use less water because some of our users do want such genes. Then non, it's non-stretch, it's distressed, it has a price point and uh, it is tapered and it's also cropped. So since we know all this information about this genes, we can use that to find what are the similar genes without going through the cold start problem. So this is how we typically do text embeddings. It's, this is just a two dimensional view. So you can see that we place each and every one of our products in a two dimensional view, but when we prepare text embeddings, it is multi-dimensional, but this is just for the purpose of representation that uh, it, there's products from 70% cotton to 100% cotton, and we have high rise and low rise. And you can see each and every product being plotted against this graph. So you can find which product is similar to each other by just looking at its neighborhood, right? So we would be able to find that this product is definitely more similar to it because it's also high rise and 100% cotton. But uh, this is the problem comes when it becomes hugely highly dimensional. So we have to control for the curse of dimensionality and everything when we do the text embeddings. But uh, this gives a representation of what I mean by finding similar products by using just text embeddings. So we've used what is called document similarity using text embeddings. TFIDF is uh, one method to encode it. Um, we can use word to vec We can use, um, we've used word to vec mostly, um, but we have many other language models that we can use. And uh, we are working on developing more research on that as well to find um, the embeddings for each and every product that we have based on their text. Then we can move on to what is image embedding. So basically I'm showing an example of transfer learning which is a very key um, methodology to learn image embeddings. So here you can see a photo of a panda and it gets go, uh, goes through a big uh, ResNet. I um, imagine this to be a ResNet. Of course, ResNet is much, deep, much deeper than this. And then it has a softmax function, which helps to classify it between giant panda, red panda, and raccoon. But the advantage of image embeddings uh, and the research that has been happening in the last five years is even though it is trained on a completely different subset of a different, completely different classification, we can use the trained network to help understand how we can create image embeddings for our own data. So what happens is we can then give it a dog picture, use the same network and the weights and the features that we have learned so that we don't have to retrain it on. Um, and the advantage is that this has been retrained, imagine on millions of pictures. So 
it's already been trained on millions of pictures and we, uh, for example, have only like 5,000 images of genes, then we can use those images into the network that has already been trained on 5,000 pictures and just change the last layer to classify it in this case into dog. So the original classification did not even have that kind of uh, identifier, but we can use it to classify a completely different uh, animal by just uh, learning the weights and everything from the previous network. I'll uh, talk into detail about how we used it. So we used a large input data set. So in our case, we use this data set called Deep, Deep Fashion, which is open source and available. And we trained a ResNet on top of it. And ResNet by itself is a transfer learning based on um, ImageNet that Google and other companies are trained on. And we use that. Um, and in our case, the categories were whether it was genes or shots or what, um, whether what was the color of it, distress of it, and so on. We trained on multiple categories of it. And then what we used is we took those frozen weights and then we had a small custom data set with only 10 categories, which is with, uh, segmenting between blue genes, black genes, white genes, distressed genes, non-distressed genes, and so on. And then we added more dense and dropout layers and we changed the softmax function, of course, the classifier to classify between gene stop shots. And based on this, what we were able to achieve is um, without having to go into the computational and uh, all the complexities associated with training with millions of images, we just used what was already trained on our small custom data set. And this is kind of to represent how it would come out as. So you can see that there, there is this genes and uh, it's having a vector representation of 1000 dimensional vector, 2000 dimensional vector. You can have it how many other dimensions you want. We can control the dimensions as well. And then we use simple similarity measures or complicated similarity measures to find what is similar to that and in a vector representation. So in a thou thousand dimensional form, you're able to, in a thousand dimensional world, you're able to find what is similar to this product. So you can see that 0.6, so this product is probably most similar to it. And then we can use this to rank uh, the similarity of this product to versus other products in our catalog. And uh, what we used uh, to recommend similar product at this point is a combination of both text and image because image embeddings do suffer from certain things. Like for example, image embeddings cannot identify exactly what fit this is. So whether it's a 501, 510, 511 cannot be identified by this. Whereas a text embedding cannot identify certain character attributes of the product um, such as um, uh, certain distress. For example, our distress is not very particularly well labeled by our merchandising. So by using image embeddings, we are able to overcome that problem. We can also see this image embeddings is having slight problems in, with, with aspect to, it chooses images which all is wearing black shoes, which is another thing that we encountered. So using a combination of text and image always helps. So if you're building a recommended system, that's really my key learning that you can use. And uh, we basically built one more network which combines both of them together. You could do a simple average and rank them, which is our first um, method that we used. And then we moved on to much more complicated methods of adding one more network on top of that. And how to personalize. So now we have seen all the different uh, algorithms that we can use and told we've used all of them. So I want to show how we have used them and how we have built this hybrid recommended system that uses all of these multiple algorithms. So we divided the consumer journey, as I mentioned before, into awareness, consideration, intent, and purchase. Awareness is someone who's first time visitors. So someone who we have no idea about and um, or someone who's clear the cookies also falls under awareness because we really can't connect them. We do use third party data to collect more information about them, but sometimes we still can't connect them. Then there's consideration that is uh, people who have done some browsing behavior um, and are in their early exploration phase. So we have their browsing patterns, but we don't have much about that. Intent is people have added to cart. So once they add to cart, we do know that about 60% of the consumers purchase. So that's a really clear indication of intent and they're very close to purchasing the product that they are looking for. So the last bucket is of course purchase, which is people who purchase and the people um, who are returning after a purchase again as well. So the loyal consumers and stuff like that. So the different algorithms that we used is what I'll get into. So the first one is awareness. So for awareness, we used popularity based recommendation. As I mentioned, we don't know any, anything about the consumer. Uh, we did personalize it by device and location and season. So we did this after A-B testing, which we found that this experience wasn't doing that well, even though we introduced 10 metrics, it's good for the business, it's good for the consumer, but still wasn't doing that great. And we realized that what was happening was 
uh, when they show recommendations, it's a kerosene, right? So when mobile users are using it, they only see the top two products, whereas desktop users see all 10. So the desktop was performing well, but the mobile wasn't performing as well because the top two products really matter a lot for mobile. So then we started personalizing in such a way that the mobile first two products are higher rank and are really the thing that will catch their eye. Whereas the desktop is more of a, there's a whole carousel that we can fill with a product that they would like to buy. So we had to make those decisions. And then we also had to make decision based on location. So because we found really good patterns, such as people from Arizona really typically like to buy a lot of shots from us because they typically have a kind of warmer climate. Whereas people from New York um, typically like our truckers, uh, our jean jackets. So really showing them that first really helped boost a lot of revenue as well. And then the third thing that um, really stood out was seasonality. So in New York, uh, people really like to buy shots during summer and truckers during winter. So having seasonality accounted is very important for us. So that's what we meant by ranking it by location device seasonal purchase patterns. So first, so we always divide our problem into two parts. One is candidate generation. So first generate the top 40 products that all users will like since this is for a whole segment of users and then rank them. And when we're ranking them, we rank them based on location device and seasonal purchase patterns. These are completely customizable in the API that we can switch between, uh, if we see business seeing certain impacts or filtering certain products, we, we are able to do that. So this is kind of the experience. So now you can see the title is really clear. It says recommended bestsellers. It's not personalized for anyone. You see a mix of products. You can see some men's jacket. You can see a women's trucker jacket because we don't know whether it's men or women. Then we see uh, jeans. We see a men's jeans, women's jeans. We don't show any discounted products because it's a first time consumer. We really want them to buy some of a high price products. So you can see the price down really high. And then the next one is consideration. So this is um, who we are visitors with one past one month or current in session browsing behavior. What I mean by in session browsing behavior is let's say they started with bestsellers and then they move down the web page and start browsing. Then this bestseller automatically changes because we follow the user as they go along. So this changes on home page, it's saying changes on all the other pages as well. So we want to capture that. And uh, for these people, we use what is our content content based filtering model because we really don't have the time to because they are browsing right now. If they browse in the last one month, yes, we use collaborative filtering, but if they're browsing right now, we don't have the time to run a whole algorithm and return back because we have to return back in 250 milliseconds. So what we do is we see what are the products they're browsing and then just recommend, it, recommend similar items or complementary items. So basically use product attributes, product inter, uh, interaction. And as I mentioned, we use three types of interactions, which is if they had any purchase behavior or anything, then we can use those patterns. We can use text embeddings. We can use image embeddings of what products they're browsing and then recommend similar products. And then we are ranking them based on the last product they interacted with because they could, when they are moving across the website, they are doing all kinds of actions. They're clicking, they're viewing, they're adding to cart. So we weight all those interactions. So for example, add to cart is most prized behavior followed by clicks, followed by views, and then find what is the product they added to cart and find similar products to that two or three products to that, and then go to clicks, find two or three products similar to that, and views and two or three products similar to that, and then rank all of them together. Then the next, uh, and this is kind of the experience. So you can see the title has changed and it says inspired by your shopping. And this is a person maybe who's looking for some girls, uh, little girls or girls t-shirts. And you can see that it's able to pick up on that and show them a variety of patterns of products that they would like. And we do show markdowns here because it's really based on that person's shopping and the business is fine to show that, but not to a new user. And then we move down the path, we come to intent. This is people who have visited, who have added to cart in the last seven days. We very specifically, we chose last seven days because if they're added to cart in the last seven days, we find that their conversion is 50% higher than anyone else. So we really wanted to have them to have some kind of really personalized experience. So that's why we have um, this going on here. And uh, for them, we use um, some kind of uh, candidate generation using collaborative filtering to find similar users since they've added to cart uh, in the last um, seven days. So we do have their uh, information already stored and we can use those interactions to recommend. And we rank them based on their intent and actions again. So if they've had multiple um, actions, we can rank them based on that. And then here again, the title has changed. It's really personalized. It's because you shopped similar styles. So it's not just that they viewed some styles, they're actually shopping them and adding to cart. 
And then you can see there's a good mix of complementary products and uh, it's really based on their journey. So they have checked some tops, they've checked some uh, bottoms and we're able to capture all of them here. And uh, the next one is the purchase behavior. This is people who have purchased in the last six months. It's our easiest category and uh, also is our most difficult category because most of the people in our building are in this category because they're our employees, they've purchased. And this is where we always hear from people saying that, hey, I don't like my recommendations. Can you change something about it? So really a difficult category to deal with, but we also learned a lot because of that. So first we used to just use collaborative filtering and then just show products. What was happening is one of our employees really gave us a valuable feedback that, hey, I purchased something for my girlfriend uh, in the last six months, but I also have purchased a lot for myself. But what's happening is I'm only showing, getting a lot of women's products that because it's highly indexing on the last visit and um, we were not uh, doing anything to uh, alleviate that. So that gave us a really good insight. And so we started ranking all the browsing interactions after the purchase with intent to find the top 10 products. So we added two different scores with exponential decay. The first score is time-based and the second score is intent-based. So we combine both those scores to rank the top 10 products that will be liked by the user and then apply collaborative filtering on top of that. So it's a two-step model after that point. And then that became really useful. And um, we really found the revenue increase after that because we were over-indexing on a certain gender that we should not have. And then um, there is also the, uh, uh, and then you can see that again, the title is pretty clear. It says because you bought similar styles and um, it shows a bunch of different products. So you can see a men's and women's products because this person might have been this cross gender shopper who's been shopping for multiple people or gifting someone. So we're able to capture both of them together. And then the next, so once we, so this is kind of our complete experience that we have on our homepage, which is, um, dynamic, personalized, and uh, and is also uh, really contextual to what the user is in and how the user journey is. So to do this, as I mentioned, you have both the batch process data. So if they have purchased before, then we do the batch processing of their recommendations. If they add it to cart, we do batch processing. But if they're live browsing, then we need to use their live stream of data to personalize. So that gives you the engineering part of it, which, uh, which helps you to scale these kind of systems. So the engineering part is, this is how we started. So this is basically what was Adobe's. So we send the browsing information to them. They prepare recommendations and give it to us. So it really wasn't working, which is why we went personalized. So when we started, we thought of this as a learning to rank problem. So we thought, why don't we just use Elasticsearch, which is a good search database. We will just put all our product attributes with their score into a search database, and we will let it to uh, rank based on score and uh, relay. But what was the biggest problem with Elasticsearch, if we are a data engineer, is going to, uh, you will understand that you have to re-index it every time. So every time we launch a new product, this whole thing goes into re-indexing and it's really delayed and there's a lot of issues with it. So we were like, it won't work for all the different algorithms that we want to launch. It worked for similar products, but we want to launch at least 15 different algorithms and it's not going to scale. So then we moved on to this, uh, this thing, which was definitely much more complicated than that. So we can see that, we are collecting the clickstream and the clickstream we are using something called segment, which is our analytics provider. We also use Adobe and we get uh, them to pass through an SNS topic. Then we filter the events that we really need for personalizing and uh, which is clicks, uh, views, filters, and like we only need like 10, 15 events that we are personalizing based on right now, but we'll add more as we go on. And then filter only those events and write it to a Redis database. We chose Redis because it's really scalable. It, um, is a cache and it holds a lot of real time data and we're able to clear it. It's really, really easy uh, to understand and develop. And um, we all had some experience working with Redis, so we went with Redis. And uh, Redshift is where our uh, data is traditionally stored. So we run a batch processes on that and then we run all of this ranking stuff on EC2 instances and then push it to Redis. And then from Redis, we use DynamoDB. Um, whenever the user comes in, uh, it basically triggers. Uh, goes to DynamoDB and checks if it has a record and pushes back. If it doesn't have a record, then it goes into Redis and checks it and pushes back. The problem is when we developed all this architecture and went to do performance testing, it broke when it reached 1,000 users because DynamoDB really wasn't scalable. And we really didn't understand why we needed DynamoDB when we can directly connect to Redis. So that really led us to version 4, which is really the only architecture that worked for us completely end to end. And it's really complicated. So um, we have Redis again, 
And uh, how we did it was, um, this is basically the endpoint, uh, which was basically a Flask API that we wrote, uh, which contained all the logic and decision-making on it. So when I mean by logic, the logic is, when the user comes in, I need to identify whether he's a completely new user. Is he the user with browsing actions? Is he the user with add to cart actions? Is he the user with purchase actions? Then we al al align what which group they are in. And then we pass that request um, to the through the API into Redis. And then the API basically keeps talking with Redis and gets the output from Redis. And then goes again and asks for inventory, gets the output, goes again, asks for product details. And then we have to parallelize all of those requests. And then it makes a, a logic decision of to join all of those details. Basically, you get all the 10 products that you have to recommend to the consumer. Then you need to attach all the product details associated with it, which includes the price, the name, color, and all of that information to be passed to UI. We also have to pass the UI titles. We also have to check whether the inventory is there for the product based on our other algorithm, and then pass the recommended products to them. So everything is taken care of here. And in order to scale, we put it on uh, ALB fronted, so application load balancers fronted, auto scaling EC2, so it automatically scales. And um, um, we also had to think about what is a fail safe option? What if Redis itself fails? Then what do we do? So we put all our generic recommendations into an S3 bucket. So if this fails, there's a fail safe to go and get it. And then um, the segment part remains the same. It filters all the events and puts it here. Of course, we experienced some choking and stuff when because segment did not have the ability to directly connect, which we corrected in later versions. And then we used Redshift and then we loaded all our bad jobs and multiple algorithms to be housed on a uh, single EC2 instance in which there was scheduled cron tab jobs, basically very primitive. And then it runs every day on scheduled basis and puts it here. So we have both the real time and the batch process feeding to Redis. And then that's being used by the API to serve the recommendations. Then we felt, of course, like hosting these many bad jobs in an EC2 instance, definitely not the brilliant solution. So. We are V5, which is currently live and our enhanced version, which is also working really well. So what we did is we used AWS batch to in order to execute all the batch jobs and the scheduling is done through step functions. Then we shifted um, from all those lambdas and the filters to just a Kinesis stream, um, which really helps us. Kafka or Kinesis really helps you to stream streaming and then really helps us to put all of those into the Redis again and then use that um, hosted on ECS right now. Uh, and on ECS, we also added uh, two uh, major things. So we have the API, which has a logic, um, which is very simple. And then we have one more part of it, one more container, which contains um, just the uh, uh, logic to filter products. So for example, if the business comes to us and says, hey, this week, just don't show this product. It's a really difficult problem to go into Redis and change all our algorithms. Instead, we can just toggle here and it will automatically filter those products and make it really easy for us to filter certain products. So we really uh, looked into what are the things that we can change and really change a lot of stuff over here. So this is currently what exists. And then of course it's connected to Git uh, from which whenever we push a new version, it automatically auto deploys. And um, just wanted to show what are the results of all this uh, things that we did. So. We did an A-B test on it. Um, we are being KPIs by conversion and RPV along with a lot of secondary KPIs. And we saw that our conversion increased by 4.5% 4 4 at 99% confidence. And our RPV was up by 4.4% for our test version versus Adobe static version at 97% confidence. And we are uh, grossing about $2.5 million of incremental revenue every year, year on year with this kind of an experience. So it really meant a lot to the business in terms of revenue. And also it meant a lot to our consumers to be able to find exactly what they were looking for. And thinking ahead, uh, of course, many, many tests and many, many successes has been happened so far. Um, we've been, uh, I joined the company two years ago, so we've been doing this about two years. So we have it on our cart. Uh, so when you go to Levi's.com, everything that you see is powered by us. So on our cart, product detail pages, email campaigns, stylist apps, so when, a customer goes to the shop, a literal store. We are using their browsing patterns, their purchase patterns to recommend products to them. So that when they go to a stylist and say, hey, does this jeans look like something that I can carry well? They're actually able to see what they've purchased before and see what products we want to recommend them and go and 
recommend them that products instead of using their mental bandwidth to make a decision among these thousand products of what to recommend them. Customer service. So when someone calls our customer service and say, hey, there's something wrong with my jeans. I want a replacement. And if that replacement is not available, the service agents are at a loss on what to give them as a replacement. So we give them this recommendations through an API as well. So really innovative ways of using recommendation and it's been really successful for us. And um, we've used these in many different areas that we haven't thought of, like all the product embeddings, text embeddings, image embeddings that we created, we really went ahead and used them for our trend forecasts and marketplace analysis. What I mean by that is when they launch new products, um, the retail and uh, wholesale people do not know how it's going to perform. But when we have these image embeddings, we're able to generate what is similar to that and then tell how it's going to perform. So really uh, using it for things that we really didn't think of was really a big learning for me and for the team as well. And then we scaled it across brands. So we do this for Levi's, we do it for Dockers and Signature. We have three brands, if you didn't know. And we scaled it across geographies, we scaled it across platforms. Algorithmically, um, these are some things that we are thinking ahead for, which is user-generated images for style recommendations and complementary products. So we do get a huge Instagram feed of what people are combining it, well, what people are wearing with Levi's. And we really want to use our image recognition abilities to uh, really show them that kind of an outfitting uh, recommendation and um, also use them for multiple purposes like that. And also use them for product development as to what new products we can generate. And then we also want to use Bayesian personalized ranking and other ranking algorithms on top of our candidate generation instead of rule-based ranking that we are using right now, which is what we are working on right now. And then purchase propensity-based recommendations. So we've done, we've built multiple models for understanding whether they'll purchase or not. And right now we are using those intent scores as I showed, but we want to replace it with their actual purchase propensity scores. And then of course, CLTV-based recommendations. So based on their lifetime value, if they're high valued customers, then show them different experience. They are not so high value, show them different experience, make them high value and so on and so forth. So really a lot to do there. So that's really my presentation. And I want to thank you all for listening to me so patiently. And I'm going to open up for questions and I think I can go through Q&A. So please ask me any questions you have and go through what we have for now in the meanwhile. So is there any opt-in version of the recommendation engine? Very, very good question. Um, we do, uh, after CCPA, um, we, do, uh, we don't have any opt-in. It, it is going to be personalized for everyone. But after CCPA, if we are, we are using cookie IDs, we want to be really careful. So if some user comes to us and tells that, hey, we do not, uh, what information are you using from me? We do give them that we are using these information from you to power our recommendation system and we delete and they have the ability to delete a personalized experience. So we do offer that as of CCPA's launch. Um, and we don't use any kind of personal information apart from the cookie ID related version. We don't use any demographics or any information just to be safe on that part. So we don't use any of that. So that's that one. And um, Next one is what are special experience products that you mentioned a few slides ago? Uh, yes, I can talk more on that. Uh, what are special experience products is um, certain products that we, uh, when you go to our website, uh, for example, I can, let me think of an example. Uh, so we have a program called Loyalty, which is uh, currently in pilot and is uh, live in uh, just three test regions of Houston, LA and Chicago. Uh, so what we do there is we do these drop-ins on our website, um, which is kind of like some special collaboration collection. So we did some special collaboration with Justin Timberlake, and we do special collaborations with many such artists. And when we do those collaborations, we do not want it to be open for all users. We want it to be open only for a certain set of users who are like our high value users or our loyalty users or have already signed up with us with an account or something. So in that case, we don't want that to be part of our recommendations, which is why we, uh, we call it special experience products and we can remove them. Next question is, is this nearest neighbor? Um, I'm not sure where this question came from, but I'm assuming it's related to the text um, embeddings. Yes, we, it's kind of like a nearest neighbor to find uh, the um, optimal um, uh, text embedding, but what we are using is word to vec embeddings for each and every product, and then use Kotlin similarity on top of it to find what is similar to each product, if that helps. 
And then the next one is, it seems that you used text embeddings to vectorize the categorical data. Could you clarify why you used word embeddings instead of just one hot encoding? Yeah, it's a really good question. So yes, uh, if you just used one hot encoding of each and every um, um, text variable, it just becomes like, it's a lot. You can imagine how many embeddings we will have. We have more than 60 different attributes to explain each and every product. And when we use text embeddings um, like TFIDF, which is just you know, term frequency and inverse doc document frequency to just code them. It just makes it easier to use them. But I'm not saying one hot encoding is not easy, but it just becomes too multidimensional to do that. Um, so the next question is, what should someone study practice learn in order to be in a good position to join your team or one like it? Oh yeah, this gives this gives a good segue. Um, we are looking to hire. Um, I personally am hiring for a data analyst in my team, and I'm hiring uh, also for a data scientist in my team, and uh, also looking to hire a lot of data engineering positions. So what we are looking for is we have three different roles, right? All of it are part of the same team. So data analyst is someone who is really good in the strategic vision and decision making power. So people who are very good in SQL, very uh, comparatively good in Python or R, but do not have to write production level code is someone uh, that we're looking for a data analyst. So they work very strategically. They work with the business stakeholders, understand what the requirements is for to build these kind of scalable systems, and then come to the data scientists and tell them, hey, this is kind of where we should build a model for, and uh, can we build this model? But, and they're also involved once we, even after we build a model in terms of, you know, understanding um, where we can make improvements and things like that. Whereas a data scientist is someone who's really good in Python, of course, is really good in all the deep learning packages, um, has the ability to understand what the business requirements, translate them into models, and you really good in statistics. And because data science is a multi-dimensional field, so we do expect them to be good in all of them in, in some to some capacity. And um, that's kind of the, and then in terms of experience, we are looking for someone who has about three to four years of experience in data science, since it's a very relatively new field. Or if, if they have a prior analytics experience, that helps as well. And they have like one to two years of data science experience, that's great. And um, data engineers are someone who we really expect them to do all of the architectural stuff that we showed. And uh, the next question is, how did you evaluate your machine learning model? It's a really good question. So when we started out, we couldn't evaluate because we, as I mentioned, we don't have any data since we are launching this for the first time. But now we are able to evaluate them when we move to the um, uh, model-based um, modeling for collaborative filtering. What we are doing is we are, we are using metrics like um, precision uh, at kth position. So basically trying to understand which uh, you we can create MAPE at different positions and see how, how accurate the predictions are and see how our model is doing compared to what has already happened with some users. So those are some metrics that we are using. Uh, we do use metrics such as AUR and conversion related to the website to see how well our machine learning models are performing as well. And the next question is, what is the rationale for not showing discounted products for the first time a consumer visits your website? Rationale is pretty simple. It's just that um, as a business, um, we really don't want to show some kind of discounted products to the users who come to our website. And uh, I'm sorry, just okay. Yeah, uh, as a business, we really don't want to show discounted products when they come first to our website. We can show them after they move along their website, but you can imagine uh, the business wants to drive profits. So showing high price products really helps us to drive profits. Really, that's it. Uh, that's the reason. And uh, we do not see any detrimental impact by not showing discounted products. Uh, in the bestseller section, so we just stuck to it. So I think those are all the questions we had. Yep, um, that ends my presentation. So thank you so much for, oh, there's one more question. Uh, how can a consumer company find out if their customers actually want personalized recommendations with Netflix, Amazon, consumers have no choice. Really, really good question again. Um, so how can we find out? Um, we can find out based on data, right? So when we are showing recommendations, we do see some of our users are getting spooked out or they do not like that we are showing them recommendations and they are able to see that they are reacting negatively to it. They just bounce off 
from that page. So those are all indicators that they do not want that kind of a personalized recommendations. And we do take them really seriously and show do not show them a personalized experience in that case, where we tag them as someone that bounces off when they see a recommendation. So we are able to track all of that because we do track when you scroll on a website, we do track when you're seeing certain things we do track when you're clicking on it so we have impressions visits scroll and so on so we are able to understand to some extent and show you a different experience um with netflix and amazon customers have no choice yes that typically is how they are running their product which we cannot um, help out with so i hope that answers that question and um Really, thank you so much for listening. And um, if you want to apply, please do reach out to me on LinkedIn, or even otherwise, please do reach out to me. Uh, is that a browser data for classification? Um, yes, we do use the browse, browsing data for classifying whether they like something or not. All right. Uh, thank you, Divya, for this presentation. And uh, we would like to thank everyone uh, for being a part of this uh, online webinar. As MagnaMind Academy, we will organize a lot of events like this. So you are always welcome uh, and uh, come and join us in these online sessions. Uh, have a nice day and night for everyone. Thank you.